Greetings, everyone. I'm Lori Lane Zucker, founder and CEO of Impact Entrepreneur, and welcome to our webinar. And a special welcome to all those members of the Impact Entrepreneur Network attending this webinar today. Impact Entrepreneur is a global network of systems-minded change makers, entrepreneurs, investors, scholars, and students of social and environmental innovation who believe that this work needs to be done within a transformational framework. We build companies, we invest in them, we study them, but we also understand that we have to collaborate to build a new business paradigm and ecosystem around them in order to find an authentically sustainable way forward. So if you agree with this last statement and are not yet a member, please join the network. It is free. The only entry fee is your commitment to the business of change. This webinar is part of a series, actually two series that we are offering to uh, network members and others. The first series of which this particular webinar is a part is called Luminarius, and it offers content that is more reflective, content to contextual and inspirational. The theme for this series is fireside chats, and those who have joined our previous fireside chats know that we are quite serious about having a fireplace in the room. Here it is. Tea by my side. That's our theme, Fireside Chats, Luminarius. The second series is called Building an Impact Economy. That series offers content that is practical, hands-on, and instructive in the form of slide presentations and topical panel discussions. Our next webinar is next Thursday, June 13th. It will be a panel discussion on impact investing and social impact media. It'll feature Laura Callahan, Callanan of Upstart Collab. Julie Christias of Ta Tandem Pictures, Jess Jacobs of Invisible Pictures, Charles D. King of Macro, and Gloria O'Neill of Eline Media. And looking beyond next week, we have two more fireside chats later in June. The first is on June 20th. These are all Thursdays uh, with the Capital Institute's John Fullerton, one of the great modern thinkers on transformational finance. And the second is on June 27th with TBLI Group's founder, Robert Rubenstein, uh, where we will be focusing on the impact investing and entrepreneurship landscape in Europe. Information on these and our other programs are regularly updated on the calendar on our website, which is www.impactalchemist.com. I would like to thank our sponsors for our webinar series, Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors and their Scaling Solutions Initiative. Now I'm very pleased to introduce our program and our celebrated guest today. Named in 2014 as one of the top 20 women in the, in the United States working in philanthropy, social innovation, and civic engagement, Kathy Clark has been active, an active pioneer, researcher, educator, and consultant for over 25 years in the fields of impact investing and social entrepreneurship. She serves as faculty director at the Center for the Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business, where she founded and directs the Case I3 Initiative on Impact Investing, and co-leads the Social Entrepreneurship Accelerator at Duke, an accelerator working to scale impact of global health ventures in India and East Africa. She's also lead author of Case, Case's online learning series for impact entrepreneurs, Case Smart Impact Capital, which you'll be hearing a bit about in this webinar. And she's the co-author of Case's Scaling Pathway series in partnership with the Skoll Foundation, USAID's Global Development Lab, and Mercy Corps. Kathy, welcome. Thank you so much, Lori. I'm so glad to be here. I would like to help uh, frame our conversation today by sharing something I read just this morning. It is a comment by one David Houghton Carter, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, he's a social entrepreneur, innovator, and self-described, quote, champion of ethical business. And he's from Leeds in the UK. He made the comment in response to an article I posted yesterday on LinkedIn from the Financial Times, which was titled, Impact Investors Say Finding Suitable Companies is a Challenge. And now David, in response to this article, declares that, and I'm going to uh, quote from him, I've been involved in impact startups, founding, co-authoring, supporting for almost a decade. And I'm getting pretty weary of hearing the same old refrain. I found it to be nightmarishly difficult to gain catalyst funding for the new and the next, to start something that's both big picture innovation and mission focused. The level of risk aversion is stunning. 
the bar to entry is set so high that it's next to impossible to meet it. And the institutional will to support the untested is simply non-existent. The message is that to be fundable, you've got to be well-established, generating revenue with the market potential of a unicorn, but the mission and impact profi profile of a mature NGO. Quite how that's supposed to square with the need for innovative thinking and new solutions is beyond me. Something needs to change, and someone needs to have the courage to be the first to build a new funding model that can work in the way that founders really need it to work. So having worked myself with a wide range of early stage companies across a wide spectrum of impact, I can, I can really sympathize with David's perspective. In fact, I think it was about eight years ago, around the time I founded Impact Entrepreneur in 2011, that I published an article uh, entitled, Let's End the so uh, Social Entrepreneurship Ponzi Scheme, where I complained that the growing momentum and buzz surrounding impact investing was sending messages to entrepreneurs that was, there was a lot of money available to help seed their mission-driven start, driven startups. And that when they hit the road to look for money, they found not only that this wasn't the case, but that even finding investors who were authentically mission aligned was elusive. In my article, I warned that the space was in danger of becoming a quote, human capital Ponzi scheme with dozens of social entrepreneurial programs starting in universities and incubator programs being launched and tons of inspirational, aspirational articles being written and growing numbers of conferences being held yet on the ground there was very little available capital to support these new businesses at the earliest stages. One would like to think that the situation has improved over the last decade, but there are more than a few people like David who would argue that not much has changed. So Kathy, do you agree? What are the strengths and weaknesses in the supply and demand match of impact entrepreneurs and impact capital? Uh, let's discuss the pioneer gap that was defined a, a decade ago. Why is that so hard to solve? What a great opening question. We could talk about that alone for an hour, but I will try to be a little briefer. Um, so, you know, first of all, hugely sympathetic to both David and your point of view and the point of view and experience um, of a lot of on, impact entrepreneurs in the space who are, who are finding the process of you know, finding the right capital at the right time for what they're trying to do extremely difficult. And I don't think that's actually gotten easier. And it's ironic because, you know, we have a lot of activity on the supply side saying, you know, there's more and more capital under management. We have the gin doing surveys saying that AUM assets under management are doubling pretty much every year. Their last survey was showing that there's about 228 billion um, under management. That is both indirect investing and direct, right? And so indirect being money into funds and other vehicles and direct being the money that actually comes to a company. So when we explain that entrepreneurs rightly say, well, wait a minute, how much direct is there? Because that's the only piece that matters to me as an entrepreneur. That's actually harder to count, um, especially the early stage piece of it, which you mentioned several times, um, because it's held by private firms, angel investors who don't need to share much data, foundations and, and often government who are kind of at the intersection between grants and investment. Um, but I think that what is going on in that, in that space um, is that no matter where the capital is coming from, if it's coming with an intention to create Im impact, it's coming with some conditions. And there's a whole set of conditions that come with any capital, right? Of, of geography and stage and vehicle um, and sector um, and maybe some return expectations. And then when you layer impact on top of that, you have more conditions. Um, who are you trying to serve? What is the impact that you're trying to, to do for them? How much of it am I gonna get? Um, all of those things. Um, and so I, in, in my mind, uh, it, to me, it's a little bit less of a Ponzi scheme, which to me implies that, um, you know, kind of there's a cycling, but it's not getting back to the people that it should. It's more like a matrix where people are stuck in different intersections um, and can't find what they need because there are so, mit there are so few people in those same intersections with them. Um, and so that's kind of the macro view that I have after studying this um, across and also kind of going deep within certain areas like global health investing is realiz realizing that the burden on the entrepreneur to figure out who is in their intersection is way too high right now. And it's actually getting higher and higher as the supply, supply side gets bigger. It's actually harder to find 
the, the, the capital that's right for you. I don't think we have the right intermediaries to do that. I don't think the, the, the market can withstand them. Um, we've, you know, we are connected to people like Eric Savage, who's the head of United's Capital, which is the top impact um, investment banker in India, um, where he's built a very robust model, helping entrepreneurs shop themselves around to both impact investors and mainstream investors. He's doing it at much later stages, so he can afford it. Um, at the early stages, we don't have a lot of those intermediaries, and so we have a lot of different institutions, and we are one of them trying to become this intermediary function, um, but having partial information as we do it. And you mentioned the pioneer gap. The pioneer gap, um, which Monitor um, and some others defined a few years ago, um, you know, is really about this um, this stage that that entrepreneurs need to pass through that happens to be the hardest um, for them to find investment capital. Um, it's easier when you're really early stage to say, I have a new thing and it could be cool. And to have some people give you some grant funding or an award or a fellowship or win a contest or something that's kind of giving you free cash to figure that out. And there's a lot of people that find that very sexy. On the other side, there's people who are saying, I need to get my money back. I need to know that you're investable. What the, the, problem, the trouble is that for a lot of impact entrepreneurs, it takes longer for them to get from great new idea to sustainable revenue because they're trying to do something that people haven't done before and they need to they need to they need to they need to explore it longer and that's what the pioneer gap is it's often defined as like some somewhere between 50,000 and um, 300,000 that you need to kind of get to an investable model it's real but i would say it's also it's also made more difficult because people are doing that within their within their little intersections um, trying to find the, you know, the, the, the investors and the people who participate with a little bit more flexibility than, than, than straight market rate investors, um, you know, at that time. Um, and we kind of felt, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but, you know, we, we uh, came out of a five-year experience of running our own accelerator uh, with entrepreneurs who are basically in that gap, um, serving low to middle income populations in East Africa and India and trying to increase their health outcomes. And we learned a lot about it. And I would love to talk more about what we saw and what we did. Yeah, okay. So that was a great kind of initial orientation. And I want to dig into a whole bunch of uh, pieces of what you've just uh, laid out in the rest of the webinar here. Uh, so impact investing is a space where clearly there is a lot of financial innovation. Uh, it's a kind of rising exponentially over the last few years. Um, currently, there are over 13 types of impact investment capital in the marketplace, uh, I believe you, you've said. Uh, I want to take some time here to review these, at least a, a number of these different types of capital, uh, which are featured uh, so extraordinarily well in your very useful learning tool, the Smart Impact Capital Platform. So I'd like, if, if you can, to give us a sense of uh, some of these 13 types. And then let's discuss how well are these innovations and capital types uh, kind of uh, working for entrepreneurs. And uh, how, uh, I, I also understand that you've said in the past that investors are finding this tool, the Smart Impact Capital Platform, extremely useful to just understand the space they do. They have no idea there are so many. Uh, types of capital available and instruments available. So can we dig in further into these types of capital and the uh, kind of ramifications of, of them in the space? Sure. Um, so just for background, I've been an impact investor for over 25 years. I was doing program related investments out of a foundation in New York in the early 90s. Um, I had no idea that there were 13 <laughs> different vehicles when we set out to try to organize this um, and really understand what the state of play is, both in kind of commonly used vehicles and the, <clears throat> the addition of new innovations that people are trying to actually solve problems that entrepreneurs are facing, right? So there's a great deal of good stuff going on that is making this more complicated. When we looked across um, the kinds of things, the vehicles that people were using to make the investments, they fall into three buckets that everyone understands. There are kind of grant and grant-like vehicles. There are debt and debt-like vehicles. Um, and then there are equity and equity-like vehicles, right? So those are the, the big ones and people understand generally kind of what the, you know, the fundamental differences are between those three. But then within them, there's all this, there's all this new stuff going on. So for example, under grants, 
there's a set of um, uh, foundations um, that, that, that are issuing what they call recoverable grants. This is often very confusing to entrepreneurs because it sounds like a grant. It's actually a loan, it's actually debt. Um, and they are made to organizations who might have the possibility of paying back a loan. Um, the reason it's called a recoverable grant, which often confuses people, is that to the foundation and its balance sheet, they can decide at any time that they want to write it off and just call it a grant. And so I had a conversation with one of the entrepreneurs in our accelerator who said, I have good news. The government of Canada is going to give me a recoverable grant. It's so great. 7%. I can't remember what it was, 10 million, whatever it was. And I said, okay, can you make that payment? He said, what? I have no intention <laughs> of ever making this payment. I have no margin in my business. It's not, we're not ready for that. And I said, well, so why are you taking this? He said, well, because the government of Canada told me that if I do this, I can prove to other investors that I can pay back loans. I said, well, okay, if you don't have any intention of ever paying back this loan, how is that going to help you? Because this is actually going to be on your balance sheet as debt. For the next 10 years and he was shocked he said oh, but it's recoverable i said oh, it's recoverable to them you don't get to write it off <laughs> right so just misunderstanding the nomenclature is confusing um, we also um, did some really deep dives on the amount of the 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 the, the, the regulatory structures on crowdfunding that are available to impact entrepreneurs. We did that mostly in the US because it's very, very confusing in the US, although that you know, exists in other parts of the world as well. Um, what are the ways, what are the things that you actually have to have in place to either get donations through crowdfunding, to issue loans through crowdfunding, or to um, sell equity, um, either directly or what they call DPOs, direct public offerings, and kind of what are the constraints and conditions. And we talked to several different people, including lawyers in the space, who said, unless you have the following things in place, you shouldn't even think about this. So like just shortcutting. That particular one, it took us three months to get all of the information together into a two-page guide so that people can kind of skim it and go yes or no. Um, other sorts of things, we talk about program-related investments, we talk about loan guarantees, and then we spend a lot of time talking about what's kind of on every stage at these impact investing conferences of late, which is, which is variable repayment debt vehicles, sometimes, loan is, sometimes known as demand dividends, sometimes known as revenue-based financing. And what are the different ways that people are organizing that? What are the different pros and cons for the entrepreneur? What are the terms that you might want to negotiate most to make this work for you? And then most importantly, what are the implications for the capital that comes after this? Because what's happening is there's so much innovation. People are like, well, maybe this will work for me now, but what, what's the next investor going to think when they see that on my books or they see that I owe somebody this other thing, that I owe somebody part of my revenue? What's my, if I want equity eventually, what is the equity investor going to say to that? And in fact, we've actually had these conversations with several accelerators who are offering um, their entrepreneurs services in return for some of these vehicles being automatically the way that they're going to invest in them. And then they get into the accelerator and they have conversations and the investors all say, I don't want to touch you because of the way you've gotten capital. And so, you know, we're kind of seeing this and trying to, and trying to influence it for the first time. Um, the other thing you asked was how well are they working? Um, and the truth is that there's a lot of experimentation with all of them, um, but there isn't a lot of understanding um, about how well they work two, three, five, ten 10 years later. We did a survey of a bunch of entrepreneurs a few years ago and said, you know, did you get the capital you wanted and was it the right kind for you? Um, and close to a third of them said it was not the right kind and we regret it and we would erase it if we could, which is a really high percentage. Um, you know, I don't think we're serving the field well if, if, if that's the case. Um, so we try to help um, entrepreneurs look at the, the array of options that are in front of them, understand what are the issues in your control under this vehicle, what are the issues in terms of your future funding? What are the issues in how your work is going to be valued? Um, and what are the choices that you can make um, to think about the capital you're going to need between now and you know break even and beyond, um, so that you can actually make a milestone plan and kind of and kind of and kind of own this um, and not be reactive to you know the person you meet first and the vehicle they happen to be holding in their hands. Um. Yeah, great. Again, you said uh, so many things that are well worth digging into further. One of them being um, philanthropy's role in all this. 
Um, clearly, there is a role and, and, a, and a crucial role for philanthropies, both private foundations as well as uh, individual philanthropy and that, that going through or moving through um, family offices and donor advised funds. Yet, according to Inside Philanthropy, only the, the latest figure is uh, about 17% of foundations in the United States are doing impact investing. Mm -hmm. To me, there is a, uh, as I said earlier, a crucial role for philanthropy to be playing in the higher risk early stage impact investing space, yet they're they they still are very slow in getting into it. So what can you can you kind of give us your sense of where where this where we are right now as relates to philanthropy, its role, its proper ideal role in the space, and uh, you know where where are we in relation to where we need to get to? Oh, that's a great question, Lori. Um... As a former philanthropist, I think about this a lot, and it's obviously been a, it's been a long time um, since I was doing investing as a philanthropist. But the terrain, you know, both has changed a lot and has not changed enough, right? So, um, philanthropy is unique because um, it owns capital that is both mission primary and flexible, and legally, it has to be both of those things. Um, if it is doing a program related investment, for example, into a direct company, if you, if the money's coming out of the endowment, it's different, but if it's a, you know, if it's, if it's trying to directly invest in an individual enterprise, most foundations are doing that out of their program related investment funds. Um, and those are, it's, it's required, um, that you be flexible. And so it allows foundations to explore a bunch of different ways of doing this. Um, and so there's a handful and there's a, you know, more and more who are members of Mission Investor, Investors Exchange, who are looking at both, what do I do with my endowments to align my endowment investing broadly with my mission, which makes a lot of sense because many of their endowments are working against their mission and it's a 95 to one ratio of every dollar that they have in their endowment versus their program. So it's silly not to align it. Um, and then more and more people kind of saying, what can I do to leverage the maybe smaller amount of dollars that I have to put flexibly into really highly mission related things. Um, and what's great about that is, you know, there's, there's more, um, there's more experiment experimentation than there was 15 to 20 years ago. There's more foundations um, sharing what they're doing and the data about what they're doing. And then there's more what I would call kind of infrastructure building. So to give you an example, the MacArthur Foundation, you know, has just set up this new initiative around catalytic capital, um, which is a kind of capital. Um, they took the name from a chapter of our book that we wrote in 2014, where we were looking across very successful impact investing funds and realized that almost all of them had some sort of catalytic capital. Um, as part of their stack, uh, which meant they have said some sort of capital that was there to leverage other capital, to take a lower risk, uh, or a higher risk and lower return slice of the deal in order to enable somebody else. In some cases, it was Citibank. In some cases, it was the government of China. It was you know, very varied, um, but to enable someone else to get a market rate return and for both of them to realize that they were symbiotic in getting in, in catalyzing the, the impact to occur. Um, and MacArthur is making some really big bets on trying to expand this so that more institutions can play around with that kind of capital, that kind of flexible mission-driven capital. Um, that's, that's one end, right? That's one end of the spectrum of the kinds of capital um, that people need. The other end of the spectrum, I think, is, 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 is inst you know, uh, for-profit companies who are mission-driven um, but also are aiming to market rate impact. And there, it's harder. It's harder to get foundation capital. It's harder to get government capital. They're, they're looking at the private capital sector and kind of saying, how do I navigate the pioneer gap? Um, and what often happens, um, and I may be a little bit cynical about this, what often happens is they are forced to tell a story that is very high growth, um, even if they don't feel in their guts that that is actually the trajectory that they're on or that it's likely to happen. They have to portray themselves as that because they think that the easiest money to get is equity. And so this relates to the types of capital, right? Which is that equity is dominant 
um, in terms of people's understanding and in terms of how people find you. And you know, it's just much easier to think of yourself as I'm going to get some capital that seems free to me now that might let me grow and we'll kind of see what happens um, than it is to really think about what is your growth trajectory and what are the questions that you're trying to answer and what's the right capital to, to get right now to do that. Um, we're going to continue on talking about uh, some of these uh, questions of um, the financing of early stagers. But before we do, I want to talk a little bit about the work you're doing on the kind of entrepreneurship accelerator side. Mm -hmm. um, so you're very lucky in your roles at Duke where you lead both the impact investing initiatives that are very key to this whole space, uh, but you also co-lead the university's social entrepreneurship accelerator. Um, what, what are you uh, and universities like Duke learning from a formalized entrepreneur support program? Yeah, I am very lucky. Thank you, Lori. So we um, created our accelerator uh, called Seed about seven years ago. Um, and it's really an odd duck in the accelerator world um, because of who we are and because of um, the relationships that we had. Um, most accelerators are short term, you know, they have multiple cohorts and, and they do some intensive work and they kind of um, put them out into the marketplace and, 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 and move on. Um, our model, um, because we were partnering with USAID and they, they had some specific needs, um, our model was to work with a small cohort over three years each. Um, and then we dovetailed those. So it was, you know, successive um, cohorts. And we really set ourselves up as a learning accelerator, um, which everyone aims to be, but as a university, we felt like we had to be, which was how do we engage faculty, students, and the, uh, the rest of our practitioner networks to actually help these entrepreneurs with the challenges that they were facing. So we did a lot of, at the beginning, um, we did a lot of like, how do we formalize a curriculum, right? How do we figure out what people are, are actually struggling with? How do we deliver it to them? How do we see whether it had any impact? That kind of thing. That structure remained, but how we did it completely changed over the course of the accelerator. We started out with this kind of professor knows best model, which we tossed out the window after the first two months <laughs> because we didn't. Um, and we ended up, then we went through kind of a coaching model, which I think a lot of entrepreneurs have, which is, you know, identify a problem, find an expert that knows about that problem, match them with the entrepreneur and see how the conversation goes. We also uh, found that that didn't work especially well um, because our entrepreneurs had a lot of different problems and there was no one person who could kind of be assigned for them that long. And so we moved to an engagement model where we had a, a, a lower level staff person who talked to that, that entrepreneur every six weeks and directed them to the expertise that they needed. And then we brought them together and let them learn from each other. Um, so a much more facilitated model than a, than a top down model. Um, which, which worked really well. The other thing that we learned very clearly at the beginning, our goal was to help them scale their impact. And as a um, university center at Case, which is concerned with both scaling impact and you know, finding the right capital to, to help them do that, we really wanted to understand what their goals were of scaling, what their strategies were, um, and what information were they getting as they tested things to see whether those were working. Um, and so we actually started to do a whole bunch of assessments around, you know, what is your theory of your customer now? Do you really have customer product fit? What is the margin you have? You know, all sorts of things around business model and also organizational readiness. And we ended up um, applying the monitor blueprint to scale framework, but then customizing it. Um, to really understand where our entrepreneurs were along kind of a sequence of scaling. And we ended up turning that as part of the Case Smart Impact Capital Toolkit um, into a diagnostic that any impact entrepreneur can use um, to not only kind of understand where they are, but to understand how an investor will see them, right? It's kind of translating the mind of the investor onto the chaotic nature of what the entrepreneur is thinking about. Um, and this allows them to, to kind of see not only where they are, but what the next step would be, and then decide, do I need money to get to the next step? Is that a priority next step? Or are these other ones a priority next step? And start to put together basically your strategy for the money that you're raising. Um, the other thing I will mention is that it's a very similar tool to Vilcap. Vilcap has a new tool. I can't remember the new name of it at the moment. It begins with an A um, that allows you to um, evaluate your stage, but Vil Village Capital's tool is just for people looking for venture capital funding. 
It is inherently addressing the things that you must do if you want to get venture capital funding. Ours is vehicle neutral. Um, and so, you know, if you, you might be a nonprofit or you might be a slower growth venture or you might, you know, you'd be all sorts of things, but uh, a broader array of investor um, kind of hats uh, on that. Um, you know, so, we, so we've been sharing this tool um, as part of the toolkit. Um, we now have, we realized that what we were learning from our accelerator is really no different from many other accelerators. We were just better resourced. Um, to do a lot of it. Um, we had tremendous success in terms of the entrepreneurs um, uh, growing, raising capital. We helped them raise over $50 million of capital, um, you know, and having good impacts, which we were also collecting data on. But we started looking around at other accelerators and realizing that many of them are much less resourced, don't have curricular tools, um, uh, and weren't really sure even how to convey or understand the kind of complicated uh, set of both vehicles and investors out there that you have to put together to get capital. And so we started licensing this toolkit around the world. It's now available online and anyone can purchase it for themselves, but most of it's being used by our 59 partners around the world in 130 countries who are like universities like Stanford and MIT, um, accelerators like Uncharted, Agora and Endeavor, and conferences and networks like SOCAP um, and Social uh, Enterprise Alliance. Um, who are using it to help their entrepreneurs kind of get a leg up um, quickly. It's all online. You can go through it and then kind of, you know, be on par with it, with the information that everyone else has to make this easier. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you said, uh, uh, again, a number of things I I'm just tempted to dig into, such as uh, venture capital and uh, as you've called it, the pernicious myth of venture capital as it relates to the space. But we'll get to that in a little bit. Not getting too far off the topic of your work with the accelerator, I want to actually pull a question that's uh, in the Q and A from Ellen, where she asked, "What did you learn in East Africa and India um, as it relates to yeah. your accelerator and the funding and things we've just been talking so about more broadly?" Specifically with our global health ventures, we learned that East Africa was three to five years behind India. Uh, in terms of an investment landscape uh, and a supply side landscape and a regulatory landscape um, that was ready to support the kinds of innovations that our entrepreneurs were trying to scale. Um, that allowed, so that's one thing, and there are a whole bunch of things that came from that. One, it allowed us to take people from India and bring them from, to East Africa, and they started actually collaborating. So some of our India ventures are now, are now global. <laughs> <laughs> um, because they were able to do that. Some of them were able to form purchasing coll coll collaboratives, for example, to, to save themselves supply chain money and you know, other things like that, where they didn't feel they were competing because they were in two different continents, but they could certainly um, collaborate with some of the global, global um, pharma and distribution companies. Um, the other thing that we learned was that the regulatory structures really make a difference. East Africa, this is very technical, right? But we're talking about healthcare. East Africa and Kenya, for example, is a very prime example, um, has decentralized the policy making around health. So it has regional um, uh, governance as opposed to national governance for the Ministry of Health, which has meant that every entrepreneur now has to um, persuade multiple <laughs> government bodies um, to allow it to do things, um, which is very different from India, and that was slowing them down. India, on the other hand, um, has, and there's been a lot of research that uh, Bridgestan and others have done, India has like this incredible drive to scale that you don't see in most other countries, where if you identify a problem, there's probably another 3 million people that you can serve with that problem and easily identify them. The question is, how do you get to them? And so we saw a lot of, um, uh, investor interest in realizing what some of the lessons were from like once you see if something works at a unit, how you can more quickly scale it in a market like India, um, where the regulatory barriers were lighter. Um, and then some of the, um, uh, you know, on contrast in, in East Africa, um, tremendous amount of NGO and government support uh, within the slums, for example, or with other things. Um, and so, you know, trying to figure out how to help our entrepreneurs navigate another sector that exists in there and decide when to work with them and when not to. Those are just a few things that, that come to mind. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, just to, um, to mention to our audience that uh, we, at the top of the hour, will go more uh, intensively into the Q&A. 
Stephen, I see a question on the chat box. If you want Kathy to address that, why don't you copy and paste that into the Q&A so it can get, get onto the queue. Um, and remember everybody to upvote questions that you like. That's very helpful for me. Now, uh, Kathy, uh, what is the state of practice in terms of how entrepreneurs get to a deal that meets their needs? Um, mm. And and what and how can it, if it's not ideal now uh, or seamless now, how can it be made more efficient and effective? I love that question. That is the that is the purpose of what we what we were trying to do. So, we, I feel like the state of practice now is that everyone's kind of on their own and winging it, right? And they're winging it in high intensity, exhausting ways. I cannot tell you the travel schedules of the entrepreneurs that were in our accelerators, right? They were just running around the world to, to conferences and trying every networking opportunity they had um, to figure out what investors were after um, and try to triage their time. Um, and we interviewed them, right? To, as part of this process to say, what did you learn about this? What would you recommend to other people? What are the key mistakes that you would not wanna make again? Um, and what we ended up with is what you know, we call kind of a three-step process. Um, one is to, to spend the time strategizing before you talk to anybody. What do you need and why do you need it? And that goes from how much capital you're trying to raise, because investors expect you to justify that in a way that grant makers never do. Um, all the way to what, is, what are the hypotheses that you're testing with that capital in the next six months to a year and how, are you, how am I convinced that the capital I give you will allow you to answer them um, and learn about that, which is the early stage test always. Well, what are you gonna learn? What are you gonna learn? How am I gonna see it? Um, the second one is to target with more um, rigor than many people are. So one of the things I did is I asked I've done this before, but I asked all of our entrepreneurs in the accelerator to send me their target investor lists. Um, and I would say 75 to 80% of the people on those lists would never fund them based on my knowledge, but the entrepreneurs didn't have that knowledge. So we were like, how do we give them the opportunity to, to, to do that again? If you're not using an investment banker and you have to do this on your own, how do you do that? Um, and so we have a set of steps of like, what is the kind of capital that is right for you? What are the kinds of investors who actually have that capital? And then who are the individual investors that you might wanna to talk to? People are skipping step one and step two. They're going to step three, which is how, what investors do you know? And asking all their friends, what investors do you know? But that doesn't get to the matrix problem, which is you need an investor who has the kind of capital that you want and is delivering it in the kind of relationship that you want. And then only then should you talk to them. And so yeah, having people do that, and we have a whole, um, process that we lead people through that was built for us by some of the successful entrepreneurs. The third step is closing, uh, which basically goes from relationship management all the way to closing. How do you build the kind of relationship that you want with an investor? Um, how do you deal with initial emails, pitching, all the way through due diligence? We have um, guides to the due diligence process. When do you have power? When can you speed things up and slow things down? When do you not have power? Um, we talked to several entrepreneurs like, you know, this investor dragged me along for a year and I didn't even realize that I should have just, I should have cut bait. <laughs> didn't know, right? That that was a sign of something. Um, how do you negotiate the key terms of the deal? We have deal term guides. They're color coded. They're not written for lawyers. They're written, <laughs> they're written for, for entrepreneurs and people like me who like things visually. Um, we have a library of uh, existing deals from impact investors around the world. What are the mistakes that people make? What are the things that they wish they hadn't? We have a whole video from someone who's like, I thought the idea was to get the highest valuation possible. I thought I was completely successful. And then I had to do a down round <laughs> and it was extraordinarily painful. And in retrospect, I made a mistake and here's what I would do, right? So we have those sorts of things. And so the idea is, you know, there is kind of a stepwise logical process. It's never going to be exactly like that because life is chaotic, but you can reduce the amount of energy that you're wasting on this process. And you can put um, prompts in front of the investors that you're talking to, to figure out more quickly if they are not a fit for you, right? That is the number one thing. The number one thing is what is the homework that you're doing to make sure you're not wasting your time with the wrong investors? Um, because investors job 
you know, they're, they're, they're not always coming with their, all of their explicit needs uh, up in front. They don't, many of them have websites that don't even talk about what they do really, right? And so you, the, 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 the responsibility is, is unfortunately mostly on the entrepreneurs to make this more efficient. Mm -hmm. One last question about uh, the accelerator side of this equation before we get back into the investor side. You not speaking specifically about the Duke Center accelerator, but other ones that you've mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're following, you're aware of, and you've mentioned a few of them mm -hmm. already. Can you give one or two things that are really positive about existing impact oriented imp incubators and accelerators, and maybe one or two things that you feel like they're still missing? So what, why, why should a entrepreneur look to an incubator? What, what, what are one or two of the things that they can count on getting from that? But then what, 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 what should these incubators, what would make them better? Oh, that's a great question. So I think the number one thing that you should be getting out of an accelerator is local connections um, uh, with investor, investors, experts, and partners um, in the geography where you are. There, is, there are very few other institutions that can do that uh, as effectively as, as a very good accelerator can, who's you know, been on site for a while and, and has an ecosystem of contacts and can use that effectively um, to help you. And many of them use that through their investor pitch days, right? That becomes the, that becomes the magnet um, to bring the community together. And that's excellent. I think a lot of entrepreneurs choose accelerators with that criteria of, am I going to meet some people that I haven't met before? And are those people going to be useful to me? Um, the second thing that accelerators are really, really good at, and a lot of them are getting even better at, is the peer support. Is, um, you know, whether in our accelerator, everyone's around health, or in another accelerator, maybe everyone's, you know, looking at education in Kentucky or whatever it is, but this idea that there are a group of entrepreneurs who are facing the same problems and can learn from each other in real time, which is a very effective way um, to learn and, and just very comforting. Um, for people who feel like they're going it alone a lot of the time, especially if they're at the top of their organizations. Um, some of the things that they could do better, um, we were really surprised when we went out and started talking to accelerators that um, almost all of them, but let's say 85% of them, I'm making up a percentage, um, said we don't have any formal curriculum at all. Um, you know, we adjust to the entrepreneurs or we have mentors who do deliver curriculum and I don't own it, right? There are all these different answers, um, but nothing that was um, kind of, we're trying it and we're going to see if it works and then we're going to iterate on it and try it again. So this kind of entrepreneurial dance that we're asking the entrepreneurs to do, the accelerators weren't doing with, with um, kind of formal training. Um, and um, that was, uh, that could be improved. The second thing that I would personally say, this is my personal opinion, is I am really, really wary about accelerators that, ha that kind of require all of their investees to take money in one form as a price of entry. Um, we actually had an accelerator that I won't name. They're a great partner with us, but we had an accelerator that said in their first cohort, they were going to offer everybody convertible debt at a certain rate. Um, they gave our toolkit to the people in the accelerator before they had signed the deal. They read ahead, they looked at the deal terms, they got together as a group and they negotiated as a group to change the terms. That's yeah, so interesting. Which wow. I thought was a, I thought it was a huge win. And I said to the accelerator, was that a huge win for you? And they said, actually it was uh, because we learned what they needed and mm -hmm. we just didn't know before that. And so, you know, if we can change the power dynamics a little bit, but this idea that you, you are gonna enter an accelerator and get a certain kind of funding before you even know that that's right for you, I, I am troubled by, and I would like to see more flexibility. Understand that the accelerators are trying to develop sustainable models, um, but it's problematic, in my opinion. Just uh, regarding your point about accelerators, most accelerators not having a, any kind of formalized curriculum. Do you think that's because they've looked at what's out there and they don't like it and it doesn't apply? Or is it because they just haven't thought to do it? I mean, why? why? My informal read is that I think there's, I think there's kind of tiers of accelerators. I think there's extremely well-funded, um, well-managed um, 
longer term accelerators, Vilcap, Sandcal, GSBI, right? There's some that are, they're just like top of class. They're amazing. And they are doing, you know, an unreasonable, they're, they're up there and they're doing amazing things. We have started to look at what I would call maybe the next tier down, which they're not quite as professionalized. They have younger staffs. Um, we found out that a lot of their staff members were talking to us and then they were applying to become MBAs to give you a sense of <laughs> where they were in their career. So they just don't have the experience and they may not have the, um, uh, you know, the wherewithal to, to kind of understand, you know, to, to think about this as a longer term thing. And so they're younger, they're shorter term, um, you know, less, less formal um, organizations. Um, mm -hmm. And so we kind of looked at that and said, oh, that's an actually an opportunity. Maybe we can give them something that they don't have to invent on their own that's relatively cheap um, and could raise all boats, right? That's the way we looked at it. Um, but the, but that's the, the reality is there's a, there's a lot of very thinly staffed accelerators because they're all struggling with their business models. Mm -hmm. Yes, they, they are. And uh, I think that that points to another issue that we've uh, discussed in previous webinars and also in a recent report that Impact Entrepreneur did with Rockefeller Philanthropy on the need for more field building funding for, you know, whether it be hubs, incubators, accelerators, or, or think tanks in the space. Uh, let's shift over in the last 10 minutes or so before we get into the Q&A over to really the, the investor side of the all of this. Uh, let's talk about venture capital, um, high multiple exits, unicorns, and other aspects of the VC world. Uh, what you've called it the myth of venture capital. What is what is the myth of venture capital and why, in um, your opinion, and I think in my opinion too, is it so pernicious for, for impact uh, companies? So I was trying to think about how to explain this concisely, Lori, because I feel like it's a belief I've held for so long that I have to kind of extricate it again. Um, I think the myth is pernicious because I think venture capital is both, um, well, it's ubiquitous, first of all. If you search for investing on Google, everything, every resource that comes up is about venture capital or, or a private or equity. You know, if you're looking for entrepreneur investment, that's what comes up. Um, so it's, it's widespread. Um, two is it is um, inherently sexy to think that you are going to be growing fast and having tremendous success, um, right? So fast equals success in our little brains. Um, and third is it's actually, it's easier, right? It's easy for an investor. The only thing you really have to worry about is valuation. And that's kind of it <laughs> at the beginning of the conversation, right? As opposed to debt where you have to look at a whole bunch of more ratios and understanding of the capital structure and what's actually going on and what's the likelihood that you're going to be paid back and what's the loss reserve you might need if not and all, right? There's all these things. Venture capital is much easier. It's much easier for the entrepreneurs as well because there's, they feel like it's free. I get equity. Great. We're going to ride together and see if this works. But what they don't realize is it's not free at all. It's coming with really real constraints about your control, <clears throat> which often relates to mission because the number one lesson of the first 10 years of me studying social enterprises, which led me to help create B corporations, was that their missions were, were getting subverted when they had capital rounds. People would say, that's a lovely tool. We're not going to use it for kids anymore. We're going to use it for shopping. Take it away. Um, so, so there's a mission risk um, with lack of control. Um, there's obviously a lifestyle risk of do you want to be in charge of this venture for a long time or do you want to let somebody basically take it to what it could be and you may be in or out. Um, and then there's a, there's a speed risk just of um, not, you know, of, of, of the capital structure that a venture capitalist deals with which everyone sort of understands, but when you actually see the math, and I teach this, is much clearer. You must have a set of high growth wins in that portfolio, or you will never return the capital that you have promised to your investors. It forces you to be risk averse. It forces you to look for high growth things. It forces you to make them high growth if they are not. <laughs> It, you know, it forces you to actively say, but you have to choose the segment that's going to grow the fastest. And we have to get rid of this other one. 
right? So it's, it, it, is, it, is, it is forcing a whole set of decisions by the math. They have no choice. By the time someone is running a venture capital fund, they do not have the ability to choose this anymore. So if you're running a social venture, any venture for that matter, but social ventures, it's really important. I feel like the most important question to ask yourself is, are you ready to be on a speedboat? Or are you still exploring and you need a canoe, <laughs> right? Are you still exploring what the customer actually wants? I'm trying to sell primary care services to a slum in India. I've done it for six months. I have no idea whether this is going to be the right model in the other two neighborhoods. And I'm, I'm going to need to explore that. I'm going to need to, to, to hire somewhat differently. And I'm going to have to make them all a little bit different at the beginning and then figure out which one works. That means you're not on a fast curve. You're on a slower curve, at least for now, to figure it out. And you need slower capital to take that ride with you. Once you get venture capital, you're on the speedboat. They might toss you out of the boat on the way <laughs> because it needs to speed. And that sounds very drastic, but when you actually talk to investors, that's the constraint they're under. That's the deal they've made with their stakeholders, and that's real, right? That's a real legal commitment that they have to do everything in their power to, to earn that return. You as an entrepreneur have the responsibility to do everything in your power um, to have the kind of business and the kind of impact that you intend to have. And so it's a, it's a, it's a forcing question. I feel mm -hmm. like I rambled, Lori. I'm sure you mm -hmm. have other things. No, you're not rambling at all. This is fantastic. I, um, let's see, we have a, just a few more minutes. I really would like the help of everybody to go onto the Q&A queue and do some upvoting for us so we can prioritize when we get to the Q&A just in a few minutes here. We've got a whole bunch of uh, interesting questions there, so please upvote. A couple more questions for me. Yep. I want to look in the last couple of questions about the impact investing space more broadly. Um, some, maybe many, uh, investors in the impact investing space see it as just another way to allocate capital. But this is why you have more than a few institutional impact investors and family offices that have created, well, they're investors, they're, and then they've created impact investing funds that live under the same roof as fossil fuel focused funds. This is, the, this is kind of like, for me, Coke celebrating their plastic pollution initiatives, which are terrific, while they continue to produce products that are uh, not only uh, plastic, but uh, primary cause of diabetes. Um, how important do you think it is for impact investors to fully buy into the ethos of impact? For example, aligning all their investments, all their investments with the sustainable development goals and circular economy principles and practices. So this might surprise you, but I'm actually really happy for people to start wherever they can. I do not have an all or nothing philosophy um, on impact. I don't subscribe to that even within leading business schools, right? I don't require as a condition of me working at one of the top business schools in the US that everyone in, in, in my faculty or, or in this community agree with me um, that businesses have a responsibility to people beyond their shareholders. Not everyone here does. And yet we're here, right? We're here to have a conversation. We're here to start uh, talking about things. Um, and I think the same is true with investors. Start wherever they can. Um, begin with some amount of money, some intention. Do something that's aligned with your values. I don't have a problem with it being housed alongside the things that they know how to do um, and that they have confidence in. You have to start somewhere. Um, there are also, you know, tremendous amounts of uh, uh, examples of people going all the way to aligning 100% of their portfolio. Um, most of those are not corporations or pension funds, right? Most of those are family offices like RS Group or Blue Haven or the Kleisners or the Philip Foundation, right? They're, they're, they're small, tightly knit uh, organizations where a bunch of individuals can say, we want, we want to do this um, and we're going to make this real. Um, but I think most other institutions, for my vision to happen, which is that everybody becomes an impact investor, I think most institutions have to start small. Um, and see what they learn. What's most important is that those two groups talk and mm -hmm. learn from each other mm -hmm. and see if yeah. you can break down some of the perceptual barriers on the side of the people who think that this is always going to lose money by showing them what you can actually achieve, right? Mm -hmm. you, you need performance and you need data and you need conversation. Mm -hmm. I have to admit, I've got ambivalence about this, uh, this question I just asked you. Um, 
and um, because I have ambivalence, I'm going to ask one more question that's going to kind of push push back a little bit, even though I I do sympathize deeply and tend and, and often agree with what you just said. But Steve Waddell, a systems scholar who gave one of our earlier webinars in this series, discusses what he says are three types of change, incremental, reform, and transformational. Now, I'd like to discuss where impact investing currently sits and where it should reside in this spectrum of change, especially in the context of urgent timelines, some may say deadlines, uh, given to us by the United Nations Panel on Climate Change, which was approximately 10 years they gave us, right? Or this week's report out of Australia that said that no or insufficient action on climate change, which is the current state of affairs, uh, poses a quote, un an existential risk to human civilization by the year 2050. So I'd, I would argue that for impact investing to have anything other than the transformation of systems and our economies as a primary focus is actually a red herring given this context. But I'd be interested to hear your per perspective on kind of the broader role of impact investing in the world um, as it's evolved and now. And I know that's a big question and uh, we wanna get to Q and A's, but if you can offer a few tidbits of, of uh, insight, that'd be great. I love big questions like that. And I'm, as you were talking, I was going off in many different directions that are completely incompatible. So there you go. There's my, the, the insight into my brain is that I think a lot of different things about this. I, I, I hugely feel the urgency on climate change and I equally feel the urgency about um, social systems of equity. And I actually, my own personal view is that the two of them together is what we're facing. You know, we're gonna face rising oceans and displaced people, um, more and more of them over the next decades, kind of no matter what, even if impact investing succeeded, I think that's gonna be, you know, that's gonna be our issue. That's the E and the S, right, of E, S, and G. <laughs> so they really matter, the governance is then, how do you structure it? Um, on the other hand, I also don't think that, I don't think that impact investing that isn't systemic is a red herring. I think that the single mother in Baltimore who has access to affordable housing because the Annie Casey Foundation made a PRI to an affordable housing organization is worth serving today, even if that's not systemic. Um, I think the same thing about a little boy in Tanzania who's using a delight lantern to do his homework. That is valuable in and of itself, intrinsically valuable to serve someone with, a, with an impactful product or service. The, issue is those two things might not last. They might not serve many people. They might not reach a tipping point. And maybe if we organize it a little bit differently, we could, right? And that's what we're, and that's what we're after. So um, I see it as kind of not either or, but both. I want to alleviate pain today. And I want to think about things in a systemic way. Um, and I want to feel a sense of urgency about that. Um, I also think I teach systems change as, 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 as Part of my regular courses and I, I, one of the ironic things about systems change is that you actually can't see it when it's happening. You see it afterwards. <laughs> and that afterwards can be, as you said, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. We're really bad at that, right? We're really bad at judging transformational change um, and understanding where we are with it. I mean, just think about divestment from South Africa, right? Which is how, where socially responsible investing started. It was about two decades of people talking about it and starting to experiment with it before governments started to listen and started to actually change their policies and then pension funds change their policies, right? So the actors who have the most weight in a system are not gonna be the early actors. There has to be all of this activity that leads up to them feeling comfortable actually doing the thing that tips the, the system. And it takes all of us, it takes all of us to do that. And so I don't feel like this, like if I were at stage two, I don't feel mad that we're in stage two. We just have to drive to stage three and get a little bit, get a little, because mm -hmm. I have a very developmental um, piece of that. On the other hand, you're right, 2050, like that's soon. Mm -hmm. That's really, really soon. Mm -hmm. uh, if I could wave a magic wand and have more, you know, pension investors and, and government investors and large institutional investors see the data that has already been shared about how well sustainable investing works, for example, I would, but we're doing the best we can. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like we're in the middle of it with divestment from fossil fuels, right? There's a lot of forces pro and a lot of forces con, but there's movement. You know, when the Rockefeller Foundation 
divest, you know, <laughs> something is, something mm -hmm. is afoot. Right. Um, or, uh, so, you know, I don't know if I, if I, if I, if I answered that. Uh, I, well, I wasn't expecting the answer just yeah. to, to hear your thoughts on some of those points yeah. that I made. And that was terrific. Uh, let's go right to the Q and A. We've got uh, 16 questions there. We'll get to a few of them. We're not going to get to all of them. That's why we need the upvoting. Uh, AJ, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, has the most um, thumbs up. So we'll start with AJ's question. How do we access, how do we get access to the resources that Kathy is talking about, such as finding the right investor for you? I'm so glad that that was upvoted. Um, that one's easy. Uh, you go to a website, which is at casesmartimpact.com. So C-A-S-E, smartimpact.com. Um, and you can sign up with a credit card uh, uh, and access the resources. There's a lot of resources in there, but they're all kind of little tidbit size. So you can jump around to the thing you need and you'll have six months of access. So you can do it, you know, alongside uh, the fundraising that you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, can you, Rachel asks, can you explain more about equity crowdfunding and the restraints of it? I wish I had that all in my head. I do not. Um, equity crowdfunding um, is under state regulation as well as federal regulation. And so what I recollect from it, I'd have to go back and look at our materials again, I haven't looked at them in a while, is that depending on which state you're in, how many states you're operating in, how much money you're raising, there are different options for equity crowdfunding. Um, and then there's a whole different set of things um, for direct public offering. But again, if you go to casemartimpact.com and you go to the types of capital module, um, there are little two page guides on all of these things, including three of them on crowdfunding. Great, yeah, there, there's definitely a specific expertise that's evolving in that, in that sector. We're likely to have in the next season of our webinars, uh, a panel on equity crowdfunding. Great. Uh, Ellen, asks if policy and regulatory framework create barriers and hurdles for entrepreneurs, what are tools or approaches to assess those barriers and navigate around them? Hi, Ellen. Um, that's a really great question. I feel like, I'm not sure, I'm trying to think of an example that I could use. Um, the, the, the conversation I had a little bit while ago when I was talking about it was thinking about some of the regulatory issues in Africa um, around health and, you know, often what we would uh, recommend that the entrepreneurs do, and I've seen other impact investors do this, actually, IGNIA has done this a lot in Mexico, where an entrepreneur was trying to address a social, social need and came across a regulatory barrier. They would often try to go alone and try to have a conversation with the policymaker or the regulator or the governor or whoever it was and had no success. Um, and they went through IGNIA, um, which has a set of uh, people who were kind of considered more elite and high level and had government connections. And IGNIA would on a regular basis um, kind of develop relationships with policymakers so that they could channel the needs of their entrepreneurs through those conversations. This is a great asset, right, to, to actually realize if I'm in a regulatorily, uh, you know, if I'm in a regulated industry and I'm looking for investors, maybe that's one of the attributes that I want to see if my investor brings to the table, which is um, government partnerships, relationships, and sophistication. Do they even understand? Um, that's often true for environmental industries and health um, some agricultural industries, do they understand the rules of the road? Do they know what's changing? Can they help me identify risks? Can they help me solve problems? Uh, to add something more to this, we, we've spoken about philanthropy and philanth the, the role of philanthropy earlier in the webinar. Um, it's interesting to see that new entrants into the philanthropy space, such as Chan Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife Priscilla Chan, Lauren Jobs, they uh, have they chose to use different structures than the traditional foundation to do their impact funding work. So Chan Zuckerberg is an LLC. Uh, the Emerson Collective, Lauren Jobs is, I believe, also is, is not a foundation. It's it's all it's an investor. Uh, Blue Haven is another one that's men been mentioned, a family office that's using a kind of integrated or blended capital approach. So 
to what there's a number of takeaways for me there. It does, it kind of asks, begs the question, is philanthropy with all the rules and regulations that Ellen is kind of um, suggesting here more broadly, is, does, is it time to retire the foundation structure in favor of something that gives us more flexibility to build what we might call an impact economy or what, what impact entrepreneur calls an impact economy? Do you have any further thoughts on that? Um, I love your questions, Lori, because I feel like in every case you're saying, well, wait a minute, what if we went to the extreme? I'm going, no, 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 we could be in the middle. <laughs> so I'm going to do that again, <laughs> which is what's wrong. We have LLCs, we have foundations, we have all of these people doing both, right? So OMDR network has two structures. Chan Zuckerberg has two structures. I think, uh, the Emerson collective only has one structure. The disadvantage of the LLC structure is that it doesn't have transparency. There is no regulatory requirement for them to share what they spend money on, who they gave grants to, who they made investments to, right? Um, if we were going to retire, I wouldn't say what, retire the foundation structure, maybe we create a more transparent intermediary um, to understand if, if Chan Zuckerberg puts out a press release saying, we've created this structure for good, I would like to think that they are then responsible and would like to be transparently responsible about what they are doing to get the credit for being good. As a foundation, they have to report that. You can look up what they're paying their salaries. You can look up who they're giving money to at, you know, uh, through GuideStar or Candid, it's now called, um, the CEO of which is on our board. Um, you know, on the LLC side, you know nothing. And so to me, the idea of it's, if it's a public good, I want you to be transparent about it. That's the regulatory direction I'd like to see it go. Mm -hmm. Amalia in the chat is asking you to repeat the website. Uh, I, I assume you can just uh, Google can case, case Smart Impact I'll Capital. Okay, that would be chat. great. Yeah. There you go. Whoops, I mis misspelled it. Will you do it again? Oh. Not so fast. And, you, and send it to everyone. You just sent that one to just Okay, I will send there it to go. all panelists and attendees. And it's spelled correctly. Excellent. Terrific, terrific. Uh, okay, let's, we have time for another question or two here. Um, I, I'm not going to pronounce the first name right. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not even going to try. Eggles? I'm sorry. I, I'm not uh, good with names. Uh, what do you think of Opportunity Zone funds as a source of capital for projects, businesses, in low-income communities? Let's just stop there and ask that part. Oh, boy. So Opportunity Zones are complicated, <laughs> are built to create a tax advantage for equity holders, full stop. If you don't have equity in your deal and your investor doesn't want a tax break from it, it is completely irrelevant for you. So if you are a company that is trying to locate in an opportunity zone, they're already designated, and there is an equity piece of your deal, there could be a reason for you to think that either you want them or they want you, <laughs> right? You might want them because they might be more flexible in making sure that they can get some part of the tax credit based on the data that you'd be providing them or the assurance that you'd be providing them that you're, that you're serving low-income people. Um, you might want them, that, you may want them because you want their flexible capital. They might want you because they want to show that they're working in that zone to get the credit. So there is a potential mutual advantage there. Um, right now, the structures are very complicated. Um, there are a bunch of foundations creating up, uh, setting up their own opportunity zone funds and also trying to, to designate uh, opportunity zone funds that are more interested in impact or dedicated to impact than simply trying to get the tax uh, right off and benefit. The, re the way that they're doing that, which is very smart, is to say there's a minimum level of reporting that you should expect from an opportunity zone fund that is actually trying to have positive impact in this low-income community. The problem is the, the way the code is set up, and we can go on, we don't have 10 minutes to do this, the, the way the code is set up, any investment in that community, even one that gentrifies and drives low people, income people away, counts. So it's an anti-impact regulation that we're trying to turn into a pro-impact regulation. And so you just need to be careful about that. Um, there's, some, there's a lot of really good information coming out of Calvert, Kresge, Rockefeller, and MacArthur right now on Opportunity Zones and the U.S. Impact, in, Investment Alliance. 
Right, and we did a recent uh, webinar on Opportunity Zones. You can find that in our, our uh, archive. So uh, we have time for one last question, and Jen, you get it because you've such a great question. He, she says, this is the best hour I've spent recently. How can I not ask this question? Oh, uh, do, you have a, do you have an executive ed or any other course coming up? Kathy. Thank you for asking that, Jen. Um, so the online toolkit that I talked about, the casemartimpact.com, is really like executive ed, only completely online. Um, we do also have a gender investing program um, that we are going to be doing in Durham live uh, from September 9th to 11th. Um, and if you're interested in that, we're just about to put the registration site up. But if you're interested, please email me at kathy.clark at duke.edu and we'll send you that information. Um, we, we ran it last year uh, and it was tremendously successful. Um, and then in the works, I will mention, we are in the final stages of negotiating a contract um, with the UN to do a um, online training on how to account for your impact if you're investing in the SDGs, uh, how, to, how to measure, manage, and report um, on SDG investments. And we're really excited about that. Great. So we have a whole bunch of other questions that we just don't have time for. What I have done is I've copied and pasted them into a document and I'm going to share them along with the uh, text chat because it was such a good and interesting sharing of uh, resources and contacts and that in the text file. I get the chat text file. I don't get the uh, Q&A for some reason a flaw in the Zoom platform, but I, I have cut, cut and pasted the questions that were not asked there. So you'll all get that along with a link and a password to uh, restream this um, uh, webinar via Eventbrite. It'll come from me via Eventbrite in the next hour or two. So look for that. And um, yeah, and we will be also uh, putting this up on the archive in, within the next week. I'm likely to produce a, a special audio podcast version of this as well. It's so rich and uh, something that people might want to listen to in their, on their way to work. Uh, anyway, Kathy, thanks so much for the generosity of your time and pro for providing us with such incredibly valuable insight into both impact entrepreneurship and investing. Deeply appreciate it. As do I. It was such a pleasure and such great questions and comments, which I didn't have a chance to acknowledge the whole way, but was watching and uh, uh, look forward to um, watching further webinars in your series, Lori, because you made this such a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, again, we get another one next week, Social Impact Media and Impact Investing. Crazy good panel for that one too. So uh, please, please consider joining us. Anyway, take care, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye now.